if you can, as a brand, uh, in, you know, insert yourself into whatever that is and then engage with your audience and then make whatever you're doing contextually relevant to them at the time, the place, whether it's a physical or virtual time and place. The world is in for some big changes. And as marketers, it's hard to know what's going on right now, much less what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. But luckily, we have a great guest on today to help us get a glimpse of what's to come. Welcome back to Marketing Trends. I'm your host, Jeremy Bergeron. On, and today we are joined by Don McGuire, the Chief Marketing Officer at Qualcomm. If you don't know this company, they are behind everything tech happening in the world. They are looking at what's coming with 5G and even what 6G is going to look like. Their tech is in helicopters on Mars and they are developing future cities that will make the customer experience flawless. We dive into some really interesting stuff in this conversation. Let's get to it. Before we dive into this conversation, I wanted to say thank you to our partners at Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com forward slash marketing. Now let's get into it. So just want to say thank you like for being here. Su super, ex yeah, the, the timing, I mean, that you were coming down, I did not think we'd be able to get you in person, but love that you came to Austin. And you know, it's interesting. I have found, I haven't, I wasn't really a big LinkedIn participant, I guess I would say in the past, but in the last year, and I think since I became CMO and um, my, my executive social team is, you know, has kind of got my my social profile, helping me build my social profile. I've been more active on LinkedIn. And so I, I go there more often just proactively. And I have to say, I've made some really, really great connections on LinkedIn via LinkedIn. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool found an agency in New York called Lightbeam that we're doing some stuff with that I found, he, you know, he just reached out to me on LinkedIn, the principal there. And so it's been a pretty good tool. So, yeah, I agree. We're, we're finding a lot more leverage as well. We met with their, their team yesterday, actually, some of their LinkedIn folks and the stuff that they're interested in on the in the media side of things as well is really interesting too and we're excited about what they're up to they seem to be bullish on creators and like supporting creators and then they have all this thought leadership that are on their platform here's some questions about um this is about rising customer expectations so a large percentage of marketers are, say that meeting customer expectations is more difficult than it was a year and change ago how has this played out for you at qualcomm and and what is your team doing to tackle this kind of consistent challenge of rising customer expectations it's a great question. Uh, so I'll address it in two ways. Uh, so there's the B2B side of, of our business. And the biggest challenge in meeting customer ex expectations for us right now is supply chain, uh, right? The supply chain issues have really cut across all, a lot of different product categories, but in semiconductors and chips, quote unquote, obviously been um, felt and seen and heard. And I guess the good news is that we all now realize how important chips are and not the potato kind, because and now there's this heightened level of awareness of that there's chips inside of all these different products that we use every day. And if they can't, you know, be shipped or if, if the supply chain gets disrupted, you know, then there's not as many cars on the lot. There's not as many products on the shelf. And so our ability to, 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 to meet their needs is, is something that's challenged. So we do multi-source, uh, which has helped us this uh, problematic time. And we went ahead and, and bought capacity ahead of the curve. Uh, we went ahead and, and once we started seeing uh, issues with supply, contacted our suppliers, and we did go ahead and commit to capacity two, three years out, actually. Wow. Uh, on the consumer side, um, when it comes to, you know, meeting co consumers' expectations with our Snapdragon platforms across phone, PC, auto, wearables, and XR, um, it's really about when we deliver our next generation platform, making sure that the features and the technology is as advanced as what consumers expect, right? So that we're, our performance is there, you know, for gamers, for example, um, that we've increased our performance, uh, we've, we've lowered, we've increased our power efficiency, we've increased our performance, our CPU, GPU, AI, functionality, all of those features are state of the art and next generation and, and industry leading because that's what we're known for. And so the pressure that comes every cycle, we introduce our, our, our leading edge platform every year, a new one. It's, it's Snapdragon 8. And we do that in December at our tech summit in Hawaii. It's a, it's a global media event of like about 400 media and analysts from around the world. And, uh, and that's when we, we announce our next generation, you know, premium platform, uh, Snapdragon platform. So the expectations are high for that, right? Over 20% increase in performance, new features, you know, on, on for camera, new features for gaming, new features for AI, for security. We announced, for example, on our new, our next generation Snapdragon 8 uh, platform that we, you can mint an NFT on the platform and you can secure it. Um, so it's stuff like that, that we have to keep 
ahead of. And we have to keep topping ourselves in order to meet those consumer expectations. That's something that my team is really uh, conscious of. And, and we have to help position our products, obviously, in the best way possible. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of activity, a lot of intensity that comes with, with launching our next generation platforms. That's interesting. I mean, it, it seems like there's something, I mean, I, I put a crystal ball down because like you're able to, you know, in terms of supply chain, you're able to kind of see, okay, two to three years out, we need to be at capacity here just on innovation. And it just hearing you share reminds me of, uh, we had a conversation last year with the CTO of AMD, this guy, Mark Papermaster, right? Yeah. He's an old Apple guy. And he shared about the idea of how they have these really, these meetings, they call them cre creative uh, contention, where in terms of innovation and R&D, they're, they have dedicated teams of people who are thinking three, five years out in like intensely. And they have a really, you know, an interesting approach there, but how is it play out there? At, Cause to me, the same thing at Qualcomm, you have to be delivering and you have to be thinking way ahead, you know, and making that a reality as fast as possible. What is that like? Yeah, we actually, um, we actually look 10 years out. Um, so, uh, and, and what guides us, um, at, at our core is, is, is generational shifts in wireless, right? So we entered the 5g era in 2018, 2019, we started investing in 5g technology 10 years prior. So in 2008, we were already exploring, we were already investing in R&D, our inventors were already tweaking and noodling around, whiteboarding out, testing. 10 years before, we, we believe the inflection point hits where there's the generational shift and the market shifts. So we're already, for example, we're a few years into 5G. There's several releases of 5G to come. But the difference between 4G and 5G was a monumental generational shift. It wasn't like incremental, it was monumental because 4G created you know, really the, the, the app store, right? 4G created the Ubers of the world. They, they allowed for these, for this, for the app stores to exist. They allowed for all these new services, the shared economy, because you couldn't do that on, from your mobile device before 4G enabled that. So that was pretty, that was pretty monumental as well. But, but 5G is really about, not about phones so much, is that it's about how wireless technology is going to permeate all these different industries and really help digital transformation across industries. And so it's the scale of 5G is so much broader than 4G was. 4G was pretty much contained to the smartphone, right? It really made the smartphone happen. And now we're talking about all these different devices, a gajillion devices, all talking to each other, all transmitting data, all eventually getting to the cloud, but also at the edge and across all these different product, product categories. So the advent of the IoT, the advent of the, of the smart connected car, um, all these types of things, smart cities, which we were talking about a little earlier, all these things are going to happen because of 5G. Even though we're only a couple of years in and we're, and we're moving from what we call release 15 to release 16 and enabling some of those new use cases and services, we're already in, we've already started investing in 6G. And, and we don't like to talk about it a ton because, hey, there's a lot of there's a huge runway for 5G and there's a lot of really goodness to come, but we have to start investing 10 years ahead. And in our R&D, we invest billions and billions of dollars in R&D every year. And that's what we're known for. And that's how we keep our industry leadership and how we push ecosystems, um, right? That's, you know, we're sort of in some circles known as the great enabler because as, as a company, we, we create ecosystems. We also create open platforms for which others can build upon and innovate upon and then bring really amazing things to life. We're not a vertical oriented company, right? We're not an exclusive oriented mindset. We're an inclusive oriented mindset. Let's build an ecosystem. Let's bring partners to the table. Let's really invent technology that can change society. And, and it'll manifest itself in so many cool ways. And that's awesome. And that creates economies and that creates abilities for, for new businesses to launch, for creators to create new things, for inventors to invent new things, for a, a rover to go to Mars and a helicopter to fly on Mars. I'm very proud to say that Snapdragon is on Mars in the form of a helicopter. So, you know, it's it's those types of things that if we didn't do what we do, um, back to what, you know, what Mark was talking to you about, it wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen. And that's really, uh, you know, some people know about that, but not 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 enough people know about that. So uh, so that's something that we're really proud of. And that's really core to our DNA. If you back off of or if the outwardly facing Snapdragon, consumer oriented sort of brand storytelling that we're doing and, and that we've been doing more of lately as we push Snapdragon more and more closer to the consumer. Uh, if you back up from that, what's really core to our DNA is really this heart of invention uh, and innovation that's been since the company was founded by Erwin Jacobs, you know, um, back in the, in the early nineties. So, so that's kind of what we're all about at our core. Wow. Can you talk about the smart city a little bit about maybe what you're working on there and what you sure. see happening in the smart city space? Well, uh, we have several business units, uh, revenue streams and business units. And our, within our I, the IoT space, we have a business group called Connected Smart Systems. And within that group, uh, we have a smart cities accelerate team. And again, I talked about ecosystems and partnerships, right? So 
What this team does is this team brings together a group of partners across the ecosystem, whether it's, you know, cameras or whether it's security partners or whatever it might be and build architectures and designs so that municipalities or campuses or private enterprises or universities or whoever that might be can actually digitally transform their environment. We have a big event called Smart Cities Accelerate that we have every year in San Diego. And we have local governments, state governments, country governments come and sit through seminars and, and keynotes and fireside chats and listen to this ecosystem of partners talk about how if they're looking to transform their, let's say, a city, it's not just about smart street lights. It's about waste management. It's about transportation. It's about all the different services that local government, state government, regional government, whatever, are trying to provide to the citizens and how to digitally transform each of those areas. But then how do they all work together, right? Because you have to look at both individually and also holistically. So our attempt with Smart Cities Accelerate is to bring all the different companies together, all the different product providers together and build this fabric, right? So that a city can come to us and say, okay, here are the, here's my list, right? And we can say, great. We can check off everything on your list. And by the way, here's the architecture that you need to put in place so that not only are you transforming waste management, but how that impacts then transportation and how that impacts then electricity or the power grid or whatever, whatever, that all needs to connect to each other as well. And then you add all the data layers on top of that and everything else. So it's, it's super helpful. And then our team goes out with the, with partners and we, we bid on projects and I'll give you an example that is public. So San Diego state university in our hometown where Qualcomm is headquartered is a very large campus. Uh, and they are actually expanding their campus. And part of that is a new stadium that's being built for, for the Aztecs. And so it was announced a few weeks ago that I slapped our Snapdragon brand on the new stadium and went ahead and did a naming rights deal. There are lots of great reasons why we did it, but the number one reason is because San Diego state wants to digitally transform and be the most connected campus in the United States. And the stadium is just the tip of the iceberg there. So what we, what we did is we worked with San Diego state and with the president Adele, who's uh, amazing. And we basically said, look, we want to put Snapdragon on the stadium uh, because there's lots of brand goodness there, but more, we want the stadium to be an amazing connectivity experience for your fans and for the people that are providing services in the stadium, whether it's again, waste management, whether it's parking, whether it's security, whether it's vending, we want to make sure that it is a, a really well-connected environment. On top of that, there's an innovation district going around the stadium, there's the new campus, and then there's the old campus. So let's take this all the way through San Diego State's entire campus environment for your student population, for your faculty, for your staff, and let's work together to make San Diego State the most connected campus in the United States. So the project is much bigger than Snapdragon Stadium. Snapdragon Stadium is great. It's going to be awesome. It opens in September, but it's really about making San Diego State the most connected campus in the United States and all the services and goodness associated with that. So that if you're an engineering student and you need to work on CAD, that you don't have to be in a, in a building on a workstation doing your homework or building whatever you're building, you could be in the quad outside on an always connected PC because of 5G, because of ultra wideband or millimeter wave connectivity, you can do your homework sitting on the grass, right? Or from anywhere, you don't have to be in a, in a, in a room, you know, hardwired into, into Wi-Fi. And so it's really about accessibility for both students, faculty, and staff, and for, you know, efficiency and productivity and making the learning experience at SDSU a really, really good learning experience. And then that spills over into the community where San Diego State is located is kind of more southeastern San Diego. We have our, our Think a Bit Lab, which is uh, about all about promoting STEM in every age group of kids from elementary school through high school. So we're going to expand our Think a Bit Lab um, initiatives into Southeast San Diego, um, which will increase accessibility from a DE and I perspective to kids who may not have access to those types of programs. So it's, it's really a very um, deep and rich partnership, but it's really about creating a smart campus. So that sort of goes back to the original question, which is talk about smart cities, smart campuses. Those are the types of things we're engaged with. So they're both great technology stories, but they're also great sort of goodness, societal goodness stories, um, because the more the digital transformation um, has a positive impact on the environments where people live or learn or work or play, I think, uh, you know, moves society forward just uh, maybe a little bit. You've been quoted saying, if the window of opportunity opens, you jump through and ask questions later. Do you still bring some of that kind of intuitive into the into the day to day or into some projects or opportunities that may come across your plate? I believe I do. Uh, it 
probably drives my team crazy sometimes, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I do jump. I do tend to jump in, ask questions later, but I think that's exciting because I think a lot of really cool stuff comes out of that. And I'm not afraid to fail. I mean, I've had a lot of failures in my life, you know, and both my, my professional life and, and you learn more from that than you do from successes. Absolutely. And I know that's cliche because people say that all the time, but it, it is true. And so I'm not afraid of failure. And I think if you are, if you can get, eliminate that fear, I think, you know, there's so many opportunities that, that you can explore and it, but you have to have permission to fail. I like to think that I give that to my team. I, I don't think that that was an environment at Qualcomm, quite frankly, that was part of our culture historically, but with our new CEO, Cristiano, he has actually provided that permission. It's, it's not a untethered permission to fail, but it is a, it is a long runway. And we have been a, you know, we are an anxious, impatient bunch. If things don't work, you know, out of the box, we tend to bold them up and move on, but we've had to learn to be patient and we've had to learn to test. And we've had to learn to try and as, especially as we've diversified and entered new product categories where we are not the incumbent only player, so to speak, um, we've had to take a different approach. So we've, it's, it's a new muscle for the company. And it's, it's really been helpful from my perspective because I had a team when I first started who was extremely afraid to fail. And to the extent where they did not want to try things for fear of it not being a home run. How do you foster that if it's not there before? Instilling uh, just some everything from little behavioral shifts to, hey, you know, don't like uh, w when we be reporting out on different KPIs on different programs, right? Everything I noticed that everything was always amazing, right? Everything was like, we hit the ball out of the park. It was awesome. And I'm like, okay, well, what went wrong? And like blank stares, uh, you know, what it, I'm like, it's okay to talk about what didn't work. In fact, it's maybe even more important to talk about what didn't work as well as to talk about what did work because that's how you learn. And then you adjust and the next time you get better. And so I literally mandated in every KPI readout, I wanna know what worked and I wanna know what didn't work. And it's okay. You have permission to air your dirty laundry. You know, I'm not gonna judge. Uh, it's about it's about discussing. It's about having dialogue and really saying, okay, why why do we think it didn't work? Another muscle that we're building is is moving from just data, right? Oh, we three x this and four x that and ten x that. Um, of course, you know, it's all about numerator and denominator, right? So <laughs> and optics. But okay, great. So we have all these stats. We have all this data. Where are the insights? So. One of the things that we've had to build is this mem this memory or this muscle memory around, don't just give me intelligence, give me insights. So if you're looking at some data, what does that, what do you think it means? Before I came became CMO and uh, our former CMO, Penny and I were working on the transition plan and the succession plan. We talked about uh, the fact that we needed to restructure to prepare ourselves for the Cristiano era of leadership at Qualcomm. And, you know, Steve was our former CEO. He retired announced his retirement in January 21, retired in July. Cristiano um, was named the successor. He took over in July, a week before I became CMO. And, but we all, we knew, you know, both of us knew the differences between the two. And they're all, they're both brilliant, but they are very different. And the Cristiano era for the company is really all about diversification, product, pushing Snapdragon into, you know, closer to the consumer, expanding into automotive, expanding into all these different new product categories. With Steve, it was more about the invention side. It was more about making sure that Qualcomm had permission, really permission to exist because there was a dark time there. We were being attacked from all sides and super unjustly and pr primarily because people didn't understand our role because we never said anything. We never told our story, which is a mistake under my watch, we will never make again. That was a huge learning experience for the company. We thought it was okay to just not say anything. Like let our partners talk about what, what their products, you know, we're just here to enable, right? So we don't have to tell our story. Well, when you do that and then something happens, you leave it up to someone else to tell your story right. and they can form the narrative however they want. And that's what happened. Um, and there were certain companies and entities that tried to form a narrative that painted us in a very, very un favorable light, which was completely false. You know, we were able to recover and, and react and, and fight our way through it. And Steve was brilliant with that. Um, and he deserves every mic drop moment and every book deal or whatever that he gets out, out of that because it was brilliant. And it's, it is definitely a case study in, in steadfast leadership and never flinching. Um, and he was great with, with that. Cristiano is this high energy, Brazilian, charismatic, externally facing, right? Ted talking guy who is just an amazing leader, so passionate. His heart and soul is Qualcomm. He's done his time. He's earned his stripes and he wants to take the company. Now that Steve has really set up the company for growth 
and clear air, he's the person to launch it into the future. And so, so we had to prepare for that and we had to shift our thinking. We had to re restructure. Part of the restructuring was uh, we need to build both intelligence and insights. So we, I formed a whole group that that's their sole responsibility. And we didn't have that before. It was sort of fragmented across my team and a couple other teams, but, but it's something that I think is so important in order for us to be successful in the future um, that I dedicated a team to it. But you sit at this intersection, you know, across the executive leadership team. The CMO is like one of the most interesting roles on the ELT because you've got to be able to, I mean, one, you're setting the you're setting the tone of the culture in many ways, but you have to be able to align with these other stakeholders on the ELT, the size and scale of Qualcomm. I mean, you've got to be doing a lot right there. And it's also not easy. I mean, you've got to be really tight with IT. You've got to be really tight with finance, of course, product and all these different, you know, parts of the business. You're, you're right in the middle of all of it. How are you balancing all that? Because that's also a lot of information, a lot of stuff coming at you. How are you aligning? Prior to my arrival at Qualcomm, Qualcomm has, has, has been a story of organic growth um, um, over the years. So kid, and it's, to be honest with you, it's quite true in so many areas. We're the largest corporate startup and we're still the largest corporate startup. We have 46,000 employees, but in a lot of ways, we still act like a startup. And there's positives to that. It keeps us nimble. We can, we can act and move and jibe very quickly. We can get together and solve problems fast because we don't have a lot of bureaucracy, but that, that also means we don't have a lot of structure. And it, it, and it's also because of the organic growth, it also drove a lot of fragmentation. Um, so at one point in time, I believe, uh, from what I've been told, there were 12 different marketing organizations at Qualcomm. Um, because it was about, oh, let's go do this project over here. Oh, that needs marketing. Okay. Hire some marketing people. Oh, but the, and it wasn't organized at all. And everyone was going off and doing their own thing. And it was this big, you know, big bang theory of, of things coming together and, and this amalgamation of, of, of technology and insight and innovation and invention and really smart people doing some really cool stuff. And some of it worked and some of it didn't. And then they peeled it off and got rid of it or whatever. And it was like that for a number of years. It was just like, who is Qualcomm? I don't know. Cause there's, they're just doing so much different stuff, but then that kind of settled in over time. And, and we sort of made our, you know, forged our path. And so what had to happen is the organization had to catch up with the evolution of where the company was headed. And it, you know, every company goes through life cycles and, and transitions and sometimes corporate culture and organizational structure lag behind that evolution. And I think that's been the case. So in some areas we're playing on a catch up, but, but even before I joined that, that started to happen where 12 marketing organizations became six, became four, became two. And then right before I joined two became one. And so there was this one marketing team in theory that was brought together organizationally, but it really wasn't brought together culturally. And when I came into the organization, there was still this sense of there was this team and that team, and we were all under the same roof. We all reported into the same structure, but there was still this like disparate tension. Um, well, these are the folks that came from this marketing organization. And these are the folks that came from that marketing organization. And I pretty much oversaw a, a group of people that came from one side, the side that was absorbed into the other side. So there was some interesting dynamics and that kind of existed. And Penny and I did a really good job of trying to bridge those gaps and, and really kind of work through that. Cause we were both fairly new. I mean, I started a year before she did. So, you know, we were kind of coming from the outside, outside perspective. And so we tried to break down those barriers and we did a good job and we made progress, but even in, and I think Penny would admit this too, you know, she was, you know, she had to point her attention towards, you know, she joined the company and then all hell broke loose and there was litigation and there was big companies trying to kill us. And there was all sorts of other things going on. So she had to spend a, a fair amount of her time on that. Um, and so some of the cultural and organizational stuff, you know, kind of had to wait, but meanwhile, we're kind of pushing forward and we're forging ahead. Um, so when in our transition plan and our succession plan, one of the things that I, that I spoke with her about and she agreed, I said, Hey, now I think it's the time to take it to the next level. And so the, so I came up with this concept. It's super simple. And it's it, 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 again, you could call it cliche, but I came up with this concept, this concept called hashtag one marketing and it, it but it, it's, it's a word, but it's really about what that, what that means. And I, and, and what really, what I wanted to achieve with my team is it, we are one marketing team. And, and so we have to act like it. And our, our charter is to serve the entire company, not just business A or business B, but we have to serve IT just like they have to serve us. We have to serve HR, we have to serve ventures, right? And, and so that is our charter. And so we've restructured, we've reoriented, we stood up culture teams, process teams um, to really work on this new kind of culture. And we use the, 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 the handoff uh, between Penny and myself as this opportunity for, you know, for this kind of new approach. 
And again, it's not, it's not about what Penny did wrong or what I did wrong in, in our past. It was about, this is a, an opportunity, a moment. Um, so let's push the envelope and let's like push in the direction that we both believe the marketing organization needs to go in. And let's use this as the opportunity to do that. So, so we've, we've rolled that out and it's really, you know, from my perspective, it's like, I don't want to, this is not a top down thing. This is, you know, I'll set the framework, uh, with my leadership team. And then I want the entire marketing organization to participate in building out what this really looks like. And so my cultural team is, is made up of, you know, working level people from across the marketing organization who just volunteered beyond their day jobs to be part of this team to help us better define our culture. Um, same with the process team. And so it's really a grassroots effort. And then and then we're starting to implement some of the results from some of their work. So it's 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 really fulfilling and satisfying to see this happen, this transition. And and it's it's we're we're you know putting our big person pants on. Right? right? We're, we're growing up as an organization and, um, and it, it's the right time to do that because there's so much opportunity ahead of us, but if we're not organized right, and if we're not structured correctly, and if we don't have the right mindset, we're not going to be successful. So it's, it's mission critical, but it's also opportunistic and it, it's giving everybody sort of a new sense of energy uh, in the organization. So I don't think it could come at a better time. Um, and I'm really excited about where it's going to take us. Awesome. Tell me about a product or company that you think is really well marketed. It can be anything, but preferably not in your industry. And then tell me why you think they're marketed is great. So I think what GM did with the Silverado electric truck during the Super Bowl with the Sopranos um, ad was brilliant. I, I thought that was amazing. What a what a what a fantastic way to to introduce a, a, a product. So I thought that was really 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 nicely done um, by Deborah and her team to uh, to you know cut, break the mold, come up with something new, especially for GM, right? I mean to go the Sopranos route, right? That's uh, sort of out of the box. <laughs> and so uh, so I thought that was great. Another example I'm trying to think of, I thought what Salesforce did in the Super Bowl was also super cool. I thought they took a, a juxtaposition to all of the spaceships and, and missions to Mars and that all these tech gazillionaires are, you know, embarking upon and turning that on its head with the Matthew McConaughey stuff. Um, it was funny because I was talking with, uh, with some Salesforce folks in, uh, at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, uh, a week and a half ago, and they asked me what I thought about the, the ad. And I said, well, I thought personally from a marketing perspective, I thought it was brilliant right? It's, Hey, instead of looking out there, look down here, there's a lot of stuff going on. Right. And there's a lot of good we can do. And so I thought that in itself as an idea was brilliant. Now, I don't know what your KPIs were, right? I don't know what you were trying to accomplish it. You were trying to accomplish, Hey, Salesforce, we're, we're good people, right? Cause we're, we're planting trees or we, we think you should plant trees or is it just about brand? And is it just about making sure Salesforce has a lot of goodness as a brand? If so job, well done, right? Fantastic. But, and maybe there's a bigger campaign around this that moves down the funnel, right? That connects the dots between that concept and, you know, doing more business with Salesforce. I don't have the luxury of seeing that yet, but if that's what Ann and team had in mind, again, fantastic. So I said, as a pure marketer, I thought, and as a consumer watching it, brilliant, right? Touched on a, on something that I hadn't seen anybody else touch on, right? It's like, Hey, instead of looking out here, look down here. Um, so I thought that concept in itself was brilliant. And then I said, look, wh whatever your KPIs are, whatever the future holds for this concept, I'm excited to see and, and, and how successful it is for you as a brand and as a company it really depends on how you've structured this thing. And again, I'm not inside, so I don't know, but from a pure brand perspective, as far as, you know, is Salesforce a, a group of really interesting, fun, cool, good people in a really sort of progressive and upstanding brand? Absolutely. Um, that's what I took away from it. It's like, wow, they tapped into something that was super, super cool and a little funny. And, and, but yeah, why are we all like looking out there, right? When there's a lot of stuff going on down here. I thought that was brilliant. That's awesome. You touched on NFTs a little earlier, and I'm just curious, kind of sound bites on this, you know, can NFTs and the metaverse be strategic for brands? If so, what are the, some of the things you're seeing? Some are saying, of course, they're providing, you know, profitable new business models and revenue streams. What's your, what's your thoughts there? I think it can be. I think the, one of the big things that it will do for brands is just drive a whole other level of engagement if done right. And it, and, it, and engagement, I, I guess I would put right under engagement is relevancy because I think it's going to, whatever your form of the metaverse that you believe in or whatever, I don't think anyone is going to own the metaverse, right? Like I was talking on my talk yesterday here at South by about like Snoop buying property in the metaverse. Fantastic. Um, he's got the money to do that. Fantastic. But, but no one's going to own the metaverse and it's going to take different forms. But if you can, as a brand, uh, in, you know, insert yourself into whatever that is and then engage with your audience and then make whatever you're doing contextually relevant to them at the time, the place, whether it's a physical or virtual time and place, I think that is probably the closest brands can get 
to intersecting, uh, uh, you know, the need space with a consumer than than we've ever been in the history of of marketing. And and I'm talking about this in the context of just retail, for example, right? If you're to, to be able to engage with a consumer as they are walking down the aisle of a store, and as they're walking down the aisle and they're thinking about products or they're shopping, to be able to again in an opt-in manner, right? Um, not in an intrusive manner, but let's say that they've opted in to hearing from you as a brand whenever and wherever to be able to intersect them. Hey, don't forget to pick up that box of Cheerios. You're walking by them right now. And to know that, yes, seems a little eerie, but again, if it's opt in and they want to hear about it and it's as, and as a gentle reminder, you can remind them through this technology that's permeating um, and creating the ability to connect with them in a virtual way or a digital way. Um, I think it's pretty special and it can, and it can be used again for good, but it can be used in a very business centric way to help you connect better with your audience in a more relevant contextual way. And also produce then of course, data on the other side to say, why did they walk by? Why are they, you know, and on the other side, if the product's not there, you'll know, right? If the inventory is not there, you'll know. You can you can then work with the retailer to make sure that, hey, my, my customers are walking by these shelves every day and you don't have enough inventory on the shelf, right? How do we correct that? That's a real simplistic way to look at it. But I think, I think that there are going to be opportunities to engage with audiences in a really contextual and relevant way. And it all has to be done right and on the up and up and in an opt-in manner. But I, I think uh, it's, it, you know, through XR and through the metaverse and merging of digital and physical um, or virtual and physical, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Mm, I love that. As you reflect kind of you know, over your career in, in the past and even till, you know, till today, do you have like a favorite failure that sticks out? Well, this is not, uh, yeah, this is something that's a little bit more personal, but it is business. I had, um, I had taken a, a position at a startup. It, it was an exciting, in theory, startup opportunity. Um, and, and I was hired in as the, as the CMO, uh, again, it was a small startup. Um, and I'd left a, you know, a fairly big job. I was running sales and marketing for a, for a, um, uh, you know, a large corporation in, in the, uh, the device consumer electronics space. And I got this opportunity to become CMO of this small little startup. And so I, ju I jumped in with both feet again, like I, like we talked about earlier. Um, and, um, and it's, it, it seemed great at first, right. It was like, it was all shiny objects and right. And, 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 um, uh, unicorns and rainbows. And, um, and, and it started out that way. Um, but little did I know that the moral compass of the, of the organization and its leaders and founders was not aligned with my moral compass. And so it took a while, but that sort of came to a head and it did not end well. And for the first time in my career, I, ha I ha had to exit a work environment um, sort of unwillingly, but willingly, um, because it wasn't just going to, it was not going to work. And then, I, and I didn't have a place to go. I didn't have a new, because most of my career I was recruited away, right? Somebody was coming after me, plucking me out of my current environment to a new environment, um, as was in the case of this. But this, this situation, I'd never been in, in my career ever before. And so it was scary, but I, it was untenable. I couldn't, I had, it had to happen. The separation had to happen. And then there was some nastiness after the separation that again, I've never experienced in my life because of, again, certain individuals, moral compasses. And so I had to get through that. And what it did though, was it also shed this light on the power of relationships and networks because immediately um, when kind of word traveled throughout the industry, because we're a big industry, but we're a small industry and everyone kind of knows each other. And it, I, I got inbound from several different people saying, Hey, we heard, you know, you're leaving or you're out or whatever. What are you going to do? And I had no idea. And so they're like, well, I got this project. Can you help me with it? And so I had, you know, people from big brands that I'd worked with in the past saying, Hey, can you come do this? Hey, can you come do that? And I said, you know what? I need about two weeks to sort of deprogram myself and really sort of let this all sink in and settle, but thank you. And can I get back to, and uh, yeah, I need to earn a living. <laughs> so I appreciate the outreach and I appreciate the opportunities and let, let me get back to you. I just need a couple of weeks to kind of, you know, mentally, emotionally get through this and then I'll re-engage. And what was birthed out of that was a seven year, very successful consulting business with both myself and two partners, friends of mine that, um, that I'd worked with in the past that didn't have similar situations, but had decided to venture out kind of on their own. So we formed a consulting practice and the three of us spent seven years working with big brands across technology, entertainment and consumer products 
and it was super fulfilling and it, it was, it allowed me to stay in San Diego, which I, which I loved and uh, travel around and be involved in some very cool projects. And it just, it sort sort of created a whole new career and a whole new business sort of vector for me and, and a whole new level of experience to act in more of a, a knowledge based consulting manner versus being sort of inside the machine. And, um, so I, I don't think I would have had that experience, had that path you know, gone a different direction. And then eventually one of those consulting engagements turn, turned back into a permanent gig. And, uh, and then that set my course at Intel um, for five and a half years, which then created the opportunity to come to Qualcomm, right? So it kind of all led to my, where I am today. And I don't know if I would have gotten to this place without it. Um, it was rough. It was painful. It was ego, you know, hurting, right? I mean, everybody's got a little bit of an ego, so, you know, so it, it hurts when, when this happens, but it, it really helped lead me to where I am today. I don't think I'd be as good of a CMO for a fortune 50 company mm -hmm. that I am if I hadn't gone through that experience, mm -hmm. right? Because I often, people ask me this question, you know, about my mentors and people that I've worked with and that I've really learned a lot from. I've learned as much from people that I did not like working for as I have from people who I loved working for. In fact, sometimes a little bit more because I learned I do not want to emulate that behavior. I do not want to act like this person, right? I do not want to exhibit, you know, that fear or that that lack of self-confidence or that lack of self-esteem. I want to emulate these people. So you learn you learn both. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that was a tough experience. You know, I had a family, I had three young kids, right? I had taken this risk to go start up when I had three young kids and a mortgage and you know, stuff like that. And so it was a little scary, but it literally helped lead me to where I am today. Amazing. I love it. Um, let's get into some lightning round questions. Marketing Trends Podcast is, is brought to us by Salesforce. Thank you, Salesforce. If you want to learn more, you can go to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. Uh, we have a lightning round with Don McGuire, CMO of Qualcomm. Don, first question, texting or talking? It depends on the, the urgency and the type of communication. So if it's... <laughs> no one's ever said that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I prefer talking, but texting is sometimes more efficient and more immediate. Um, especially with busy, you know, with everyone's busy. So if you really need a response quickly, messaging, whether it's WhatsApp or text, especially in the, with people that I have to communicate with on an ongoing basis at work, it's, it's just quicker and it's more immediate. And, and if it's something that can be answered in a short sentence or a response, it's more efficient for sure. I prefer talking through things by talking. So if it's something like, oh, I have an idea, but I really need to talk through it. I got to explain it to you. Definitely talking. I don't want to send a 500 word text yeah. because it's just too much. And now it's someone's, you're asking someone to read a novel, right? And, and it's just too much. So if it's short, quick, Hey, need your, need your thought on this. Yes or no. What do you think? Are we aligned kind of thing? Text or messaging WhatsApp. We're big, you know, we're, we're big messengers at Qualcomm. We're big WhatsAppers and, and teams messengers and stuff like that. But I, I do, if it's something more deeper than that or bigger than that, I really feel like I need to talk. Okay. What's what's one thing that you love and appreciate about yourself? My ability to compartmentalize, which my wife says, I wish I could compartmentalize like you do. Um, I don't know if it's a male, female thing or just it's a me thing, but uh, I can compartmentalize really well. And I think that that's been both a, uh, a help to me from a mental health perspective, an emotional health perspective, uh, but it's also helped me kind of see my way through some things is my ability to compartmentalize. And some people might find that a weakness, but I don't, I find it as a strength. What's your favorite city in the U.S. besides the one you live in? Uh, New York. Okay. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Probably want to speak every language in the world. Scale of one to 10, how good of a driver are you? I would say nine. My wife would say six. Okay. <laughs> Please fill in the blank. Something wise my elders taught me was. Something wise my elders taught me. Ah, perfect. Sue Swenson, one of my great mentors. What you do is really important, but how you do it sometimes is even more important. Love that. Would you choose invisibility or super strength? Uh, super strength. Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? Uh, frosted or unfrosted? <laughs> Either. <laughs> it is not wrong. Uh, if you weren't in marketing leadership, what would you be doing? I would be doing podcasts all day long. No, if I wasn't in marketing leadership, I think, I, yeah, I think I would probably be doing something in broadcast. Get that. Okay. What is your least favorite marketing buzzword? Synergies. You're the second person that said that one. That's great. I share that with you as well. Let's, you didn't use it this entire interview, by the way. You never, you never said it once. Last question. What would you go back and whisper in the ear of your younger self about being a marketing leader? I would probably whisper to myself, value proposition matters more than you think. Mic drop. 
We've got about two minutes left. Is there anything else you want to touch on? Exciting stuff on the horizon, future, or anything you're like that you wish? Yeah. So we have a lot of really exciting stuff going on, you know, around the company. I mentioned earlier that this diversification strategy that Cristiano has laid out, which we went public with at our investor day in New York in November, um, we did thread the needle on, <laughs> on between Delta and Omicron of having a couple in-person events in a very safe way. Uh, but we, uh, we, so we, we rolled out this diversification strategy and it's all part, it's all a part of his kind of Qualcomm for the next decade vision. And and so again, one of the big challenges and opportunities I have as the CMO is to help him articulate that vision and tell that story to all the different relevant audiences, whether it's investors, par- partners, customers, or, you know, through Snapdragon to consumers, you know, eventually. And so the the diversification in, in our story of diversification is, is really strong and we're exploding from a growth perspective in areas like automotive and across IOT in, in areas like compute. And so, so that's a really exciting time uh, to be at Qualcomm. And then what we're doing with the Snapdragon brand and to push it more and more towards, you know, the, the, the end consumer is another exciting challenge and opportunity that I have. Um, and we're, we've been announcing some really cool partnerships lately, the San Diego state, a partnership with Snapdragon stadium, our Ferrari F1 partnership, uh, with, uh, with Scuderia Ferrari, uh, really looking forward to, to kick, kicking off the F1 season here. Drive to survive has been the best education on F1 I've ever had in my life. And, and then the announcement we just had with ESL, um, where we're going to partner with ESL on Snapdragon pro series, which is really about bringing mobile esports globally to the next level and creating this accessibility for, for in the esports space for, for everyone to go from zero to hero, uh, right? We're calling it the era of everyone. And, and it's really about democratizing esports in on the device where most people are playing games anyway and where most of the gaming revenue is already being garnered, right? Which is the mobile device. So uh, so those are some exciting things going on right now that, that I'm personally and, and my team has just done a phenomenal job of executing on. That's really setting us up for the future and more, more good stuff to come. It's amazing. Don, thank you so much for being here. This was absolutely incredible. Safe travels back home. Thanks again to Salesforce for making this show possible. To learn more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing.